Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary of Magdala came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed. She ran to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. Then Peter and the other disciple set out, running together. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. Simon then came following him and went into the tomb. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in and saw and believed. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. Then she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said, Mary, she turned and said to him, Rabboni. Jesus said, do not hold on to me. Go to my brothers and say, I am ascending to my Abba and your Abba, to my Elohim and your Elohim. This is the word of the Lord. The four evangelists differ because they never thought of themselves as writing the front page of the newspaper. They were all writing on the editorial page. Mark's gospel is oldest and briefest. Matthew and Luke wrote next, not together, but each had a copy of Mark's gospel in front. We can tell in gospel parallels, particularly if you read them in Greek. You can see that sometimes Matthew and Luke copy entire paragraphs straight from Mark without missing a word. And then Matthew will change a verb or a noun or add teaching material that Mark doesn't have. Luke will do the same. He may be following Mark very closely, and then suddenly he changes a noun or a verb or adds teaching material, parables most of the time, to Mark's account. We believe John's account was written last of all, written by a disciple of one of the old sons of thunder, John and James, someone who had loved this disciple so much that he never once calls him by name in his gospel. He always refers to him as the disciple whom Jesus loved. Because he loves John so much, he cannot imagine that Jesus didn't love him more than he loved the other 11. John writes last. He must know of these other accounts, and yet he chooses to tell the story differently in some significant ways. Today, we're going to let John tell the story for us. First of all, John writes, on the first day of the week, Mary of Magdala came to the tomb while it was still dark. That may not seem significant unless you know that Mark, Matthew, and Luke have already written. There were a group of women who came to the tomb early in the morning that first day of the week after the sun had risen. Why would John change? Ah, because he had already written in the very first chapter of his gospel, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. Nothing was made that was not made by the Word. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. He came unto his own. His own received him not. But to those who received him, who believed on his name, he gave the power to become the children of God. The true light was coming into the world and darkness has never been able to put it out. Chapter 3, Nicodemus came to Jesus at night. They have a discussion, and then this wonderful verse, God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God sent his son into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. But men love darkness more than light because their deeds were evil. And the darkness of Friday still seemed to cover the holy city. When Mary went to the tomb, it still seemed to cover the city. Dr. Tony Campolo is an Italian-American. He taught for many years at a university in Philadelphia. But he and his wife chose to go to a predominantly African-American church Mount Carmel Baptist Church. For decades, he said, it's been our church. 
All week I live around academicians and students. On Sunday morning, I need to be where the Lord is, and the Lord is at Mount Carmel Baptist Church. Let there be no doubt about that. One good Friday, he said, our pastor asked me if I would be one of seven who would have a meditation on the seven last words of Jesus. He told me which of the sentences I would have. I told him I would be honored. So the other six of us did the best we could with the sentence given us, and now it was the pastor's turn. He was getting along in years. He had taken the last word, and that was, it is finished. And he walked up to the mic and spoke very softly and very slowly at first. Pontius Pilate must have felt very smug. He had now dealt with the last, most recent three disruptors, those who were trying to disturb the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome. He had sent them out to be crucified and had ceremoniously washed his hands of the whole thing. It's Friday, but Sunday's coming. The Roman soldiers had done their work. Three more Jews hanging on crosses outside the city. One of them they had made sport of all night, mocking him, crushing down a crown of thorns on his forehead, mocking him, dressing him in purple for a while, then beating him and force-marching him out to the hill of the skull. Even now they were so callous they rolled dice to see who would get his outer garment that was woven throughout without seam. It's Friday, but Sunday's coming. Mary, heartbroken, this baby she had birthed, now grown, 33 years, nothing she could have done, nothing she could have said to prevent this horrible fate. This child of hers, whom she loved better than life, now hanging starkly against the Jerusalem sky. It's Friday, but Sunday's coming. Jesus said, it is finished and surrendered his ruach, breathed his last. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus came asking Pilate if they could have the body. Pilate said, as long as we're sure that he's really dead. When they had been sure that he was really dead, these two took the body down from the cross. They buried it quickly in a tomb. Jewish Sabbath was beginning. They rolled a great stone over the mouth of the cave. It's Friday, but Sunday's coming. You see, on Friday, these people who love darkness better than light because their deeds with evil seem to hold the day and Saturday and early on Sunday, but God Almighty is about to raise the sun. He's about to raise the sun. Number two. Second important thing is this business of running, running. Mark, Luke, Matthew, they, they have nothing about this foot race with the disciples. This is the one indication we have that maybe John was younger, Peter was older, John outruns him. But then he waits when he gets to the tomb for Peter to go in first. Peter sees the grave claws, no body there. Then John goes in and he sees the grave clothes nobody and can you hear him telling this one who later wrote the gospel I knew I knew no one had taken him I knew God Almighty had raised him even as he had told us I knew it I believed Dr. Oscar Kuhlman was a great theologian of the last century he was born in 1902 in Strasbourg when Strasbourg was still a part of Germany. He received benefit of very good education and was named to a distinguished chair at the University of Basel in Switzerland, a chair that had been held by Dr. Albert Schweitzer before he went to Lamborghini in Africa. One of his colleagues there at Basel was the famed Dr. Karl Barth. 
Years later, Oscar Kuhlman was a professor at the Sorbonne in Paris and died as an old man in Chamonix, France. Oscar Kuhlman wrote once, in every great war, there comes a battle that determines the outcome of the war. Waterloo was such a battle, he said. Waterloo was such a battle. After Waterloo, the outcome of that war was never in doubt. In the great American Civil War, he said, Gettysburg was that battle. Even though Gettysburg and that battle took place in the middle of 1863 and the war would continue two more years, more people would die after the Battle of Gettysburg than had died before it, but the outcome of the war had been decided. The South would never rise to the strength that it had been before Gettysburg. World War II, he wrote, it was the Normandy invasion. No doubt about that. There was much more fighting. Many more men would die in that horrible winter of 1944, the spring of 1945. But the outcome of the war was no longer in doubt. When the Allied forces successfully came ashore at Normandy, the outcome of the war had been determined. And so is it with the history of the world, he said. Since that fateful Friday and the Sunday morning that followed, the outcome of this war has been determined that Christian people can lift their heads and shout together, Christos victor, our Christ is victorious. God has raised him. Number three. The two men have gone into the tomb. Mary of Magdala has stood back. Now John's attention shifts to her again, and we see her weeping there alone. And suddenly she returns, returns. Jesus calls her name. She turns. You see, you need to know a little bit more about language than just English. In Hebrew, the word for repentance is sub. And it's not so much about being sorry as it is being willing to turn or return to the one who gave your ruach, breathed into you your breath. Will you turn toward him? Will you return to him? Mary does. You see, we've read John's gospel, and we know that Jesus has already said early in the gospel the good shepherd calls the sheep by name and they hear their name and they follow him. Mary, in Aramaic, Rabboni, good teacher. Turn, Mary. Return, Mary. June 4, Gail and I are flying to London. We've already been making lists of things we would like to see and do, some new, some things we'd like to do again. Every time we've been to London, we find a time to go to Wesley's home where he died, to the chapel that he built. It's on City Road in London. You can ride the underground, the tube, the Brits call it. You walk a block and a half, maybe. John Wesley would be having his 310th birthday this year. When he built the church in London, he used the masts of old ships. We Americans are stronger as a church than the British Methodists are. And with American money, we've brought that chapel to beautiful freshness. As the old timbers began to fail, we put marble around them. Our first visit there, a British Methodist preacher, uh, when he found that I was clergy, asked if I could, he could show me something, and he pulled away a little bit of the cap around one of those columns and asked Gail and me if we'd like to get down on our knees and stick our hand in that hole. And we did, and you could feel the old ship's mast inside the column. 
John Wesley was an itinerant preacher. He was an ordained priest in the Church of England all of his adult life, but he rode horseback across England, Scotland, Wales, Ireland, and when he got old, he built an apartment next to the chapel. Just one room big, but four rooms, one stacked on top of the other. From the top bedroom, he could look out the window and see his mother's grave in the cemetery across the street. A few weeks before his 88th birthday, he was dying. He knew it. His closest friends knew it as well. And they had gathered around. His father and mother had been dead for many years. His beloved brother Charles, who wrote, all, wrote the great hymns of our faith, had died. John's wife had died. Family-wise, he was all alone, never fathered a child. A few hours before he died, he quietly from his bed sang one of Isaac Watt's hymns. Isaac Watt was a contemporary of theirs, those, and of course became known as one of the greatest hymn writers in all of Christian history. John Wesley sang, I'll praise my maker while I've breath, and when my voice is lost in death, praise shall employ my nobler powers. My days of praise shall ne'er be past, while life and thought and being last, or immortality endures. As the night began, he would sleep and wake and sleep, and every time he stirred or his eyes opened, close friends would hover, and the last time he opened his eyes and saw a couple of them, there was a smile on his face, they said, and he looked right at them and said, the best of all is God is with us. God is with us. Number four, tell my brothers, tell my brothers, you mean those that ran on Thursday night? You mean those who ran back to the upper room and bolted themselves in? Those who were not there with you when you died? My brothers, that I am ascending to my Abba, my Father, and their Father, my Elohim, my God, and their God. I think Gail and I have been to all of the Peggy Helmerich Library dinners. We've been impressed with the great authors who have been brought to our city, the great writers. I remember years ago when Larry McMurtry came, Gail and I had both read Lonesome Dove. I told Larry McMurtry, I'm never forgiving you for letting Gus die, ever. <laughs> One year, John Updike was the awardee. I was asked to say the invocation that night, and when the dinner was over, Mr. Updike walked over to me and said, I, I really appreciated your prayer. I grew up a Methodist myself, which means, of course, I'm no longer one. And so I asked, what are you now? And he said, well, I married an Episcopalian, and I thought the Wesleys would forgive me for rejoining the Mother Church. I said, that'll work. He said, I go with her every Sunday. And after I got to meet him and heard that he was an every Sunday kind of churchgoer, I took a new interest in a poem he had written once on Easter. I read just a little bit of it. Make no mistake, if Jesus rose at all, it was as his body. If the cell's dissolution did not reverse, the molecule renit, the amino acids rekindle, the church will fail. It was not as his spirit in the mouths and fuddled eyes of the eleven apostles, it was as his flesh, ours. The same hinged toes and thumbs, the same valved heart that pierced, died, withered, paused, and then regathered. The stone is rolled back, not paper mache, not a stone in a story, and if we have an angel at the tomb, make it a real angel, weighty, robed in real linen, spun on a definite loom. Let us not mock our God with metaphor, analogy, 
sidestepping, making of the event a parable, a sign painted in the faded credulity of earlier ages, let us walk through the door. Dr. John Buchanan retired 15 months ago from the famed Fourth Presbyterian Church in Chicago. He has written that his wife's older brother got very sick and died during Lent, just a few days before Easter. And now another Lenten season had come, and John's wife's father was dying. The attending physician and the hospice folks had said to John's wife, I think it's tonight. I think he'll die tonight. So Dr. Buchanan said he asked his wife, would you like for me to take duty tonight? You get some rest. I'll call you if I see any change at all. And she said, no, I'd rather you'd get some rest. I, I want to do this myself. I said, you're sure? She said she was sure. He said, okay. And he brushed his teeth and went to bed. Surely enough, her father died during the night. And when she woke John, he asked, how'd you do? She said, I've heard you say that hymns people learn as children, they remember all their lives. I have also heard you say that some physicians believe maybe hearing is the last of the senses to go. So I imagine that my dad was still hearing me and that he would remember songs he had learned as a child and that he had sung in churches all his life. And so quietly I sang to him, I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living whatever foes may say. I feel his hand of mercy. I hear his voice of cheer. And every time I need him, he's always near. And then I would lean in close to his ear and say, Daddy, Easter's coming. Easter is coming. <laughs> 